All right. So this training is on how to get a steers account, uh, two two applications, and signing your steers participation agreement. So who should attend this? If you're new to tier two reporting, um, if you need a personal steers account. So several uh, people in the audience may already have a steers account for other programs that they report to TCEQ. So all tier two reports are now required to be completed through steers. So this would be a additional program that you would be adding to your steers account if you already have one, but we will go over how to get a steers account if you don't have one. Steers is the state of Texas environmental electronic reporting system and is a portal to TCQ online reporting applications. These are by individual, so it's not an account that you want to share the login information. Um, we'll get uh, questions or comments about that throughout the reporting season. Uh, for example, maybe a, an employee is using their the steers account of their boss, and that's not the intent of it. Uh, the steers account is by individual. So the employee would need to have their own steers account, and if the boss wants to do something in steers, then the boss would need to have his or her own steers account. So you, you create a personal account in the steers portal, uh, select the programs, at TCQ that you're going to need to work on. And if you're going to add multiple programs, it's best to to get all that administrative part of it completed. And then after you've done that to get yourself out of what's called the probationary status on your programs, you'll need to sign the steers participation agreement or SPA. So by doing this, uh, you're able to use the system uh, and sign documents rather than submitting a wet signature. Uh, this SPA will remove your probationary status. So if you were to go to accessing steers from our website, this was what it would look like. When I'm on the phone with someone and they don't know what I'm talking about when I refer to steers, uh, tell them to do a Google search for TCEQ steers, and it's uh, the first link that comes up and can actually be a more efficient way to get there than from our TCEQ website. But here's the links if you wanted to come back to this presentation to figure out where that is. Or you may be doing it right now, which I'm not offended if you're going through it right now and setting up your steers account. That would be great. So there is an issue that you can run into really quick on steers when you go to log in. So let's say you do have a steers account, but you didn't use it for the past year, and then you think you know what your password is. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, try your password once, maybe a second time, but for sure, if you can't log in after that second attempt where you thought you knew your password, do the password reset. Because if you get it wrong too many times within a 24 hour period, it'll lock you out. And there's nothing that us at the tier two program can do to help you. You'll have to contact steers uh, and they'll have to unlock it. It's not a terrible thing. I mean, it doesn't take too long. It's just another step that you'll have to take, and it's a whole lot easier to use the password reset. So for new users, you'll go to go to Steers, you'll create an account, fill in the account information, and the system will check for duplicates and it'll find all kinds of stuff that the system things would be potential duplicates and you know you can look at those and see if any of them are you and you didn't realize you already had an account and if not then just carry on with your new account 
there's a whole bunch of questions, uh, security questions that you have to set up. And then an email is sent uh, to set up a password. That it's a. Uh, so it's separate from you being in the system, setting up your account. You'll be getting an email and uh, we'll go through it later on. You'll have to, to use that email to click on a link to set up your initial password. And you'll select your tier two applications that are relevant. So this is what steers looks like. And you'll see down uh, so on the right hand side in the middle. It says I need and those are. Your choices of my password, create a new account and then there's another option which is. Sometimes used but rarely. So you click on to create a new account. Create a new account. And then. Just fill out the required fields. They're the ones with a red asterisk. Or if you're colorblind, it's simply an asterisk. And let's see, so you re review the information and then click next. It does that search for duplicates. It'll find. It'll almost always find something to say, hey, is this you? And probably not click next. And these are questions. You have to set up five questions and answers. So be careful on this and it's best to write down uh, the questions and the answers and write down your. Your ER number and your password, because every time you log in, you're going to get one of these questions. And. Uh, I'm, I've talked to so many people and they say, well, I, I'm sure it's this. Well, you know, it just depends on how you answered that day that you set it up. And, you know, so. Like, for example, say if what's your favorite food? It answers pizza and let's say you put cheese pizza when you go to answer it and then you got a strike against you on your account getting locked. OK, and then you'll select your program to add or modify. This is that email that you're going to get and you can get really far in steers. I've uh, gotten people. Um, you know, through tier two core data and then. Get to the, the point where they want to sign and submit, but when you go and sign to submit your applications in tier two core data or in tier two reporting, you have to use your steers password and so that's when we remember. Oh yes, you have to go to this email and you have to click on that link which uh, takes you to where you set up your initial steers password. And you want to, you know, complete this uh, setup process, you know. Within say, you know, a day or two, it's not something that you're going to want to start and then let sit for. You know, till. February when you want to do tier two reporting, so if you're if you're working through this, you know, work through the entire setup process so that way you don't um, have any issues. Uh, coming back to it months later. So this is where you'll set up your your password and it's another one of those things where you just you know look at the requirements. Um, I set up a new account a test account a couple of days ago and I was trying to use a password that had a character and um, you know like a exclamation point. It didn't like that. So there's the requirements there. And then you go to log in. So your account's on probation until SPA is submitted and approved and it's telling you you do not have any programs added to your steers account. And so this is kind of what I'm talking about here, because if you let your account sit like this for uh, too long without a program, uh, you'll end up having to start over. Or get in a situation where it has to be. Unarchived. There's your ER number. You now have your ER number. You'll write that down because um, it's not something that anybody would 
just to remember. And then the programs that you want to add. So you'll, you'll go to the drop down menu of uh, steers programs to add or modify and your you may need tier two core data. Uh, we'll talk about that later about whether or not you need tier two core data, but you're definitely going to need tier two reporting. Otherwise you wouldn't be in this class. So select uh, the relevant programs. And then you'll sign your steers participation agreement after you after you've set up uh, both programs if you need them. So uh, if you were to let's say you need tier two core data and you set that up completely and then sign your steers participation agreement and then you come back and set up tier two reporting, you're going to have a 15 minute uh, waiting period before you can sign that steers participation agreement again. So you're going to want to do everything that's going to require an SPA and then sign the SPA. And it's uh, ESPA by driver's license if you have a Texas driver's license that has not been recently renewed. If you're out of state or you recently renewed your driver's license or you're above a certain age, then you'll have to submit a paper SBA. Um, a, on the SPA, uh, it's not on this slide, but on the SPA, it's real specific on how information is entered. And it'll fuss at you if, you know, the birth date's not in right or uh, any of the format is just not spot on. And if you have any problems with that, that's one of those issues. Just call and let us know what what is frustrating you. Now, when you're in steers, if you sit on a page for. Uh, too long, it'll log you out and there's a timer on the far right. It starts at 20 minutes when you're working through working in the, the steers pages and starts countdown. But anytime you go to another page or anything uh, that, that changes the screen, then your timer resets. And if it logs you out, no big deal. You'll just it'll say you've been logged out and you have to just log back in. So when you log in, use your ER number and password and answer the question. And then you'll have a list of things. Uh, logins, uh, verify that they were made by you. Just make sure that if they are all correct that you click on the right button. Uh, yes. And then to add programs, if you get to the screen and it says uh, you don't have any programs, then go to my account to add programs. That's the drop down menu where you choose a relevant program. So tier two core data, so you only need this to create or link TCEQ agency numbers. So for example, when you have a new facility or when reporting for the first time. The numbers that you're going to need when you're setting that up, if if you have them, um, are the customer number, the regulated entity number, and the TXT2 number or Tier 2 program ID. The other program that you're going to need is uh, Tier 2 reporting. This is used to create and submit your Tier 2 report. This it says, you know, all caps, this application is needed. So let's talk about core data. So you go to my account. You'll select tier two core data. And this is also, you know, if you are brand new company, uh, you're not going to have CN number. Let's say that's a brand new company, brand new site. You're not going to have a CN or RN number if you um, or TXT2 number if it's a brand new company. And so you'll be getting fresh numbers in, in tier two core data. So after you selected the program of tier two core data, you pick your access type and then the description of uh, your relationship as a facility or parent company. 
and then select the appropriate authorization. So for the access types, there are several listed here. So if you're going to be the one that's completing the tier two core data, getting the numbers of CN, RN, TXT2, and, and doing the affiliations, if you're going to be the one completing that entire process, you're going to choose the last option, which is sign. Because all information needs to be signed. Without the sign access type, you cannot submit the information. Someone else would have to do it. Or you could come back and change your access type to the appropriate one and sign the steers participation agreement again. Which is not a big deal. It takes less than five minutes if that were to happen. So when you're choosing the relationship, do not choose other. Choose either the facility or the parent company. Um, they both give the same outcome. Um, just pick one. And then for who is authorizing the access, uh, the one that's selected there, the one after the word or, is the only authorization that will not require a different individual to, to authorize you or submit information. So again, if this is going to be something that you're going to do in entirety, um, meaning even to say that you're a consultant and someone says here, uh, get this whole tier two stuff done and don't bother me about it. That means that you have been given authorization and so you're going to be choosing the option here uh, after the word or. Uh, some uh, don't feel comfortable with that and they will choose the last option. And that would mean that um, the person that told you to get the job done will need to have just a real basic uh, amount of information put in to steers. It was that third option on the steers login page that said was rarely used. Uh, well, that last option there on this page relates back to that and the information that you put in would have to be the same that the authorizing individual puts in. And here's what that uh, set of information looks like the authority, title, company, and phone. So it'd have to be an exact match of information. You know, not a big deal. It's just um, real specific. So before using the Tier 2 Core data application, you will need to sign and submit your SPA. And uh, so I did mention earlier that you want to add core data and Tier 2 reporting. There is a situation where that would not be possible. Uh, let, there has to be at least one of your facilities affiliated with your company before you can add tier two reporting. And if that has not been accomplished, then you are going to have to add tier two core data, sign the SPA, complete at least one core data application before going back and adding tier two reporting. So this is in probationary status, which means you need to sign your SBA. All right, so let's talk about tier two reporting. OK, before adding the Tier 2 reporting application, your facilities must be linked or associated with the customer and Tier 2 account. So at least one of your facilities had to have been uh, gone through the process of core data before you can even add Tier 2 reporting. Or you can use Tier 2 core data for all of your facilities and then come to do uh, Tier 2 reporting. So if you report last year and nothing has changed, just go into tier two reporting. Don't worry about core data. If you have not reported before, you will need to use core data to get your numbers. And if you have a change in ownership of a facility, um, so let's say you acquired some facilities uh, this year, then you're gonna need to use core data to, to link those new facilities that you acquired to your customer number.
So we'll go through how to add tier two reporting. Click on my account and from the drop down menu, you'll select tier two reporting. And this is what the, the access page uh, looks like for that one. So you've got the access type up top, which is a drop down menu. And then again, select a description of your relationship. And fortunately, this one does not have the other on there. So choose facility or parent company. And then on this one, you'll choose option after the word. Well, there you'll choose option after the word or except for there's one situation that you wouldn't. And then you will put in your CN numbers and make sure that you put the CN with the numbers. So let's talk about the choices you have here. So the primary account role uh, will authorize all secondary account or prepare roles and will receive a reminder email overnight if uh, they have not authorized one of those uh, that is waiting authorization. The TCEQ cannot approve any secondary or prepare roles, only the primary account holder can. So whoever your company designates as a primary account holder is going to need to be someone that is uh, has the time to go into their account and authorize any additional users. So you're not going to want it to be uh, the CEO of the company. Most likely you're going to want it to be someone who can uh, be responsible and have the time to to manage all others requesting access. So there's a secondary account role, which um, is a second from the bottom, and then there's a preparer role. So here's the differences. So uh, primary has full sign submit authority, and there can only be one for a CN. Um, this user is the only person who can grant secondary approval. So the secondary role, it also has sign and submit authority. Same as the primary. But must be granted access by the primary account holder. The pair prepare role. You can. If you're in that role, you can only view and edit tier two reports and cannot sign and submit reports and we do have several. Uh, filers out there that hold this prepare a role and and then they have a secondary or primary come in behind them and complete the submission process. So this is an explanation of what I was uh, kind of hinting at a little while ago. The only time that you're going to choose anything other than afterward or is if uh, you're setting up a preparer role. So if you're setting up primary or secondary, you would choose that option after the word or if you're setting up preparer, it's the option before the word or. And I don't spend a whole lot of time on that facility or parent company. Uh, you get the same outcome, just choose one. And then for the CN number, make sure that well for one that tier two core data has been completed on at least one facility. And then when you're putting in the CN number, it's a CN uh, plus the nine digits. And this needs to be the CN number for the company that you're representing. If you're if you're doing something uh, with uh, facilities from a previous owner, uh, whatever that previous owner is doing is at the at this point not any of, of your concern. Just worry about your company that you represent. And there's an option down below um, account number. Uh, you're probably not going to use that. If you were, it's because it's uh, internally used uh, employees within the same company. So don't worry about that. In, in most cases. So if you get this message, 
then your customer number does not have any tier two facilities associated to it. So that means you need to go over to tier two core data and complete that process. So if you get this screen instead, that's great. Just con click confirm add. Now you're on probation, which means that you need to sign your steers participation agreement. And uh, I think this is a good time to mention that uh, that email we talked about earlier, the two year expiration. So anytime you submit a steers participation agreement, it resets that two year clock. So this is what it looks like. You get the an extra column there that says probationary. And sometimes if you say you're a primary account holder and you've got someone setting themselves a secondary account holder and they swear that they've completed their part of the process and you go as a primary to look in your authorization queue and you don't see them, uh, please ask them if they are on a probationary status and tell them to sign their steers participation agreement. Then they'll show up in your authorization queue. So you have to do an SPA anytime a change is made in your Steers account, whether you are adding a program or changing your access type. Okay, so this shows again a probationary status. And where to go, you go to my account and then click on the appropriate e sign or paper SPA. And so this is what the what it looks like. And I uh, talked about this a little bit earlier about making sure that, for example, the birth date is in the format at once. Um, like say the date of birth was January 1st. Uh, 2000. Uh, make sure you put in 0101 zero, one, zero, one, uh, instead of, you know, just 11. Uh, little things like that. And that audit number, there's a, an image there on the bottom right shows what the audit number is. That's a number that uh, nobody has memorized and nobody should. So that's that long number. When you put that in, you're just putting in the numbers. You're not putting the DD with it. So again, wait to sign your SBA until you have added all of the applications that you're going to need. Um, well, unless there's a the situation, let's say you're out of state and you're representing a brand new company, you're going to have to add tier two core data. You're going to have to send a paper SBA, wait for that to get processed. You'll have to use tier two core data, then add tier two reporting, sign the SBA, and then, uh, then you can use tier two reporting. So that is uh, something that happens frequently. Let's see, that covers stuff we already talked about. So one thing, you know, if you are going to add multiple CNs, you know, you could add. You can add several CNs to your account at a time. So once you've added a so to receive secondary access approval, once you've added a CN in the tier two reporting application, you'll need to wait till you have been granted secondary approval before you'll be able to access the application. So the primary role holders, they are approved by uh, tier two staff. And Approval is granted within one business day if, it, if additional information is not required. So if there's already a primary account holder and we get a request for a primary account holder, it, it, we, as long as we are not extremely busy, like in the middle of reporting season, 
what we do is we'll ask both parties, the existing primary and the requesting primary, if it is what was in, if the request was intended and uh, wait for a response back from at least one of the parties. Because what happens is if there's a primary account holder and someone requests access and we approve that access, the existing primary account holder will have their access revoked. Uh, they will no longer have access and then they have to either sign up as secondary, which, you know, if it, if the whole process was intended, then then that's probably the next step for them anyways, is uh, they're going to request access as secondary. And if it was not intended, then they end up requesting primary and revoking the new one, so it can be messy. But let's say uh, the existing primary has left the company and then we get a request in and then I send an email out says, hey, is this what you meant to do? And then a lot of times I'll get an email back, email back says, yeah, that's what I meant to do because so-and-so left the company in June. And I say, okay, and I approve it and move on. So the secondary preparer role holders must be approved by the current steers account holder with a primary role. So sometimes we do get a situation where there's a request for secondary and preparer, but there's no primary. Well, what this is saying is that uh, nothing can be done for the secondary and preparer roles until there is a primary account holder in place. You will get an email if that situation has occurred. An email saying, hey, secondary uh, requester, there's not a primary to authorize you. So uh, you're ready to start your tier two report in the tier two reporting application. So I always tell people uh, once you've gotten all that figured out, you've actually done the most difficult part of the reporting process. Uh, getting set up is, is the hardest part. Um, and sometimes people think that they've completed their report because uh, they put in you know, done all these different things and these different numbers. Uh, well, uh, good news is now you're finally ready to start working on your actual tier two report. And there's our contact information again. Okay, so this presentation is using core data. So we've talked uh, quite a bit about what it's used for. And now we're going to take a look at how it looks and how to put data into core data to get the numbers that you need. So who should attend this presentation? If you have had a change of ownership, you may need this. If you're new to Tier 2 reporting, if you need any of the TCEQ agency numbers that we talked about before, if you have acquired a new facility, if you are, affi are affiliating RNCN and takes T2 number, or if you have reported before and nothing has changed, you may not need this. So a recap of those TCEQ numbers, there's the customer number, which is assigned to the owner operator of the facility. It's unique for each company and each CN can only be affiliated with one TXT2 number. The regulated entity number is assigned to the facility or site and this is unique to an address or location. A facility includes all buildings, equipment, structures uh, located on a site or on contiguous or adjacent sites. The TCEQ program ID is the TXT2 number. This is assigned to the CN. So it is unique to each CN meaning that each TXT2 number can only be affiliated with one CN number. 
here's a diagram kind of showing you what we're talking about with these three different types of numbers. So the CN number is up top, that's the company. And then the TXT2 number, just one number per CN number. And then you've got the different facilities. Those have their own RN numbers. With the Austin store being uh, RN number that's ending in one, and then Houston store is two, and Dallas store is three. Those are all reported. All three of those are going to be reported under that one CN number. So these numbers must be created using tier two core data if they do not exist. And then the numbers also have to be linked together or affiliated to show a relationship of the company, its facilities and programs in order for it to show up in STEERS tier two reporting. This data is stored in the central registry database. So there's, you know, you may have an RN number already and a CN number, uh, but they do have to be affiliated in core data to show up in tier two reporting. So the customer number, if your company has worked with TCEQ, you probably already have a CN number. And in some cases, uh, there may be uh, multiple CN numbers uh, when you are doing your research in central registry from our TCEQ webpage, you may find that there's maybe three CN numbers. And if you have any question on which one is appropriate, give us a call and we'll uh, help you through that process of determining the correct CN number. Uh, if you want to do it uh, yourself, uh, I suggest checking with your CPA on what is the uh, Secretary of State filing number for your company, and that'll help you to determine what is the active and correct name and CN number for your organization. If your company has not done business with the TCQ, you will need to create a new CN number. And if you're going to be doing that, you're going to need that uh, SOS filing number or uh, some other type of tax identification number to set up your customer number. So create the new CNs, uh, RN and TXT2 numbers if needed. Uh, if you acquire a new facility, it may or may not already have a facility ID number, the RN number. If it has an RN number, then you're going to use that RN number that already exists for that site. If you purchase or begin operating a facility that already has an RN number, uh, use that number. Don't cre do not create a, a new one. If uh, for some reason, uh, a new RN number is created, it will likely get merged with the existing one at some point down the road. Or you may be uh, inheriting, you know, jumping into tier two reporting and uh, just realize that some of those uh, merge situations did occur over the summer. And um, if you have any questions about why an RN number would have changed, uh, feel free to ask us and we'll look into it for you. The core data application links these numbers. Uh, they will all be created when you sign a uh, certified application. So that question comes up a lot. They, you know, uh, a lot of people will say, well, when do I actually get the numbers? It's really easy to miss it. It's so fast because after you sign and submit, there's going to be a notice of approval. It's a PDF document and that contains all of these numbers in it. And I tell you what, it's it's really difficult to come back to it. Uh, it's it's right there after you sign and submit. It's a PDF icon and uh, you want to click on that and save it.
OK, so there is a difference between the tier two core data application and a core data form. So the core data application must be used to affiliate the numbers as I've said, and it's something that it's one of the programs that's in your steers account. Uh, the, the core data form, which is a, a paper form, the, it cannot be used to create these affiliations uh, or get these numbers for tier two. So the application is the program in steers. The paper core data form is a PDF that you can access from our site. Uh, we can send you the link if you need it. There's uh, only specific situations in which you need the paper core data form. So the central registry database, I referenced that a uh, couple of minutes ago. That's where you can go to get the public information about your company or your facility. Now, if tier two data is a tier two, if tier two is the only program that your facility is associated with, then you will not see it in the central registry database. That's because tier two data is confidential. So to do your research on CN number and RN numbers, uh, search the database either by name or if you have a CN number, you can search by a CN number uh, to get a listing of your RNs. If your company is regulated by a different program, then it is searchable. And then the other way to search for CN and RN numbers is within the tier two core data application. So if you're not able to find information in central registry database because your company and or your facility is only associated with tier two, then you can start the process of tier two core data and see what you can find there. And if if neither of those processes work or you're not sure if you even need to start with tier two core data, just contact us and we can search real fast. We'll um, go over to tier two reporting and we'll see if those numbers are already existing in there and uh, let you know what the correct course of action is. So you select the core data application. Uh, it's what's shown here when you log into Steers. Looks like uh, with this test account, that's the only program that exists at the moment. So you'll select that. And then you'll select fill out. Then you have to click this radio button that says create a tier two core data application. Then click next. The activities button would take you uh, to show you what activities you've performed already. So after you click next, there is a reference number and password. Uh, this is for other Steers account holders to be able to access and work on this application. If you're not intending for that to occur, then just uh, click next and don't worry about those numbers. OK, now on this screen, you're going to only choose one of the options. So option one is used when you know your RN number. So let's say you acquired a facility and you already know what the RN number is, then you choose option one. Now option two is used when you know an authorization number for the RN for, say, a different program like uh, an air permit or waste registration then you would put in that authorization to search for your facility. So option three is used when you need to create a new RN or when you're not sure if RN exists. So enter what information you do know and then click next. OK, so this is what it looks like after you click next. Ignore the copy RE information. Uh, if this so this 
this slide is start of the process for creating a new RN. So <clears throat> given that, ignore the copy RE information button because that's only used when you know what the RN number is. So you enter the name of the site to be authorized. The name should not include any organizational indicators because organizational indicators would be something that's used at the CN or company level. That's does not belong at the site level. Once you have completed the required information, then you can click on that lower button there that says copy site information to populate the information that you had already put up top. So it's a, it's a duplication of the information. on the top and the bottom and to make it go more efficiently just click copy site information okay so when a facility doesn't have a postal service verified address what you're going to do is select no for the under the question that says does the site have a physical address and you have to give it a second or two when you change that because so the default is does the site have a physical address and it would say yes and then you'll switch that to no and and give it some time to to change uh, allowing you to put in a physical location description so a physical location description can be driving directions from the nearest major intersection or town and then we ask that you please follow the TCQ core data standards. So in the past, uh, well, it's been several years now, we would enter this type of information and we want to share with you the uh, data standards that are needed for putting in this information. So abbreviations for directional symbols, um, omit uh, spaces between like instead of N space E, you would put NE for Northeast. Um, and do not put meaningless data in the address field or physical location description. So try to keep it as short as possible, but as specific as you can. And uh, I know that sounds um, a bit conflicting and, and yeah, I get it. If you need help with that as well, let us know because I've helped some people cut down some really lengthy descriptions and because there is eventually a character limit. And uh, if you have if you have trouble with that, let us know and we can help you. Uh, cut it down to where it's abbreviated but descriptive. OK, so when you're putting in the latitude and longitude, so you've gotten down past the physical location description. You put in your city and your zip code and you've selected your county from the drop down. Then you've got to put the latitude and longitude. Uh, and we ask that you put at least four decimal places. Uh, you know, past, you know, you got um, the numbers, the decimal, and then put four additional digits at least because anything less than that is just not accurate enough and once you get out to six digits you're you're really spot on so four is the minimum past the decimal to plot the latitude and longitude coordinates of your facility you can use the tceq location mapper and that is really handy i think we've got a shot of it here okay this is the button that will uh, take you there. I have found that with any of our our maps, uh, just be patient, uh, you know, based on your internet speed and also your computer. Just give it a, a little bit to load. It will load. Uh, just just be patient with it. You can enter your address and then click search. Or enter. And then you click on the three dots to add a marker to your site. And let's say this one is, is a building, but let's say it was a large uh, a lease or something like that. Uh, put it at the front gate 
I'm going to put that dot at the front gate and that'll give you the latitude and longitude. Then you, you have to click on that marker to get the latitude and longitude. And it's going to be best to go ahead and write this down um, in case you need it later. Uh, or you may want to, you know, check with somebody, confirm that it's accurate. You can view different base maps uh, to view the different map layers. There's a, looks like a window. You click on that and then you get a lot of options. But uh, you can imagine if you click on imagery there, it, in the, uh, Depending on your computer, it might take a little bit to load. If it's, I mean, if it's all up to date, go for it. You can uh, check out any of those you want. Now the NAICS code. Um, so that is the North American Industry Classification System number. It is used to classify businesses with a six digit number based on the primary type of work the business performs. And it's best to, to go out of steers here to look it up if you don't know what it is, because if you click on that drop down, there's a bunch of two digit numbers, three, four, four five, up to six. So it, that drop down is really busy. It's not not the place to just search for your number. It's best to go to this NAICS lookup help and you type in like what uh, business function you're involved in, like say wastewater. You type in wastewater and it'll give you uh, probably, I think up to maybe three different codes uh, based upon uh, which type of wastewater business you're in. And then you choose the one that's most appropriate for you come back here to steers and start to type in that number and it'll take you right to it and you select it. Oh, and that NACS code, definitely write that one down because you're going to need that in tier two reporting. It's not going to populate for you. Okay, so now we're talking about if you are using core data for an existing RN. That's when this copy RE information button is extremely useful because you've already on option one, you typed in your RN number and you click next. And now you've got this choice to click that button and you want to do that. OK. Then select copy site information. If you're using option three, or enter data with red asterisk. Click on next save to go to the customer information. So the facility name here uh, is specific to the tier two program and can be entered manually if different from what is provided. So that uh, this is one of those, we get into one of these situations about the paper core data form here. So this is the site information and you so if you want in tier two you want it to say uh city of happy wastewater treatment plant spelled out instead of wwtp then change it here and it'll change it for tier two reporting but if you wanted to change across all programs that's at that higher level that was above this you're going to need to send in a paper core data form for that name change of the regulated entity and then verify the latitude and longitude. So if you're using an RN number that was provided to you, it's really going to be a good idea to to double check that latitude and longitude because it could be coordinates that were determined, you know, 15 years ago. So make sure it's correct because the tier two reporting system is going to make sure that it's at least within the correct county. OK, now for the customer number, you have three options. So just like with the RN number or regulated entity information, uh, you've you've got uh, three options here for the customer information and you're only going to choose one option. So option one is when you know your CN number. Option two is when you know an authorization number. Uh, 
a permit number from a different program. Option three is used when you need to create a new CN or when you're not sure if CN exists. And you'll see here uh, the last option down there is that SOS filing number, which is extremely useful if you're needing to use option three. Now, if you're using option three, you see there there's federal tax ID, state franchise tax ID, or SOS filing number. Please do not fill in all three because that's too much data to return result because that would that would assume that we have all three of those in our system. So choose either SOS filing number or state franchise tax ID. If you don't have either of those, then choose federal tax ID. And of course, if you have issues finding your CN number, contact us and we will help you. OK, so. There's a search for duplicates. Uh, it'll give you uh, a suggestion of the CN number and if it's wrong, select new customer. If it was right, then go ahead and select it and then click next. All right, and then fill in and review the customer information. And this is another one of those screens where just the required information is all you need to put in. And yeah, there's enough of that as it is. There's don't miss that box there in the upper left. It says I certify the full legal name of the entity. And then on the right side, the upper right, uh, don't forget that one, the title. Those are two that are really common to overlook. And you know, the system will say, hey, there's fields that you didn't fill out, and then you got to go and hunt for it. Here's a closer look. Um, there's that, that certification question. And so you'll get to a screen that says, do you have a tier two TXT2 number? Um, so I've already said it a few times. See, so you can only have one TXT2 number, but I did want to mention that, let's say you thought your TXT2 number was, uh, say, 65890 and you select yes and it populates with a number more like 100825 and that means that with that later number like that it means that somebody else has used core data and they selected no that there was not a txt2 number and a new number was issued making that previous uh, older number that started with a six, um, no longer your TXT2 number. So it's not a big deal. This is actually just a sequential order of numbers that is just at the program level. Um, if you select yes and it says your number is that one zero zero number, then uh, I'll just tell you that is forevermore your TXT2 number. So now your application is ready to be signed. And the first thing that jumps out to me here is there is a sign button and that is great. That means that you've got the right permissions to actually complete this process. If you're filling out multiple core data applications, uh, go ahead and select fill out and continue doing the core data applications and each one will show as a line item here and you can wait until those are all complete and you can sign and submit them together. So on the left side about middle of the page, there's a, it says select and then uh, it's a column that says select and you can either select all if there was multiple or um, select individual ones. If you were starting some and maybe ran into some roadblocks uh, a lot of times it's easier to just go to Steers home and come back into core data and fill out again. If you had done that, you would see some line items here that said in progress. If that was the case, uh, just select the ones that show ready to sign and then click sign. Now this has a, a little box that's easy to miss on the next page. 
uh, make sure you click that certification box certifying that you're authorized to sign this document and um, for our program you know I, I mentioned it earlier on about um, you know authority to do these things with our program if somebody with the company tells you to get this done that means you're authorized and that means you can check that box and you can sign and submit this you'll put in your steers password and hit apply electronic signature then you have to select the radio button submit reference number if doing multiple applications uh, you can click the return to activities page and that'll take you back to where you can select fill out if you want to do everything as a batch in the next screen you'll have a submit button so there is a in red uh, statement says do not leave the screen wait till processing is complete well that's after you click the submit button so seems to be some confusion at times um, that this is the screen that you're waiting for something to happen uh, but you're not you need to click that submit button on this screen then that will process and this is the page i was talking about earlier it's real easy to miss and real easy to just go right out of this page that link to approval letter is there that's the one that's going to have your numbers you see in the bottom right of the screen that's got all your numbers that other page is just um, you know times and dates and data of of what you entered but that link to approval letter is what you're going to want to save okay so you have created or linked your RN, CN, and TXT2 numbers. Next thing you're going to want to do is get access to Tier 2 reporting. So that is core data. All right, so this presentation is using the Tier 2 reporting application. This is my favorite presentation because we get to get into the details of actually doing the tier two report. This is the final presentation. After this, we will cover some questions and answers. So who should attend this? If you are new to tier two reporting, or if you want to review over the tier two reporting application, or you want to see the updates to the tier two reporting application. There is a disclaimer uh, about web browser compatibility. The tier two reporting system is compatible with Firefox, Google Chrome, and Edge. Internet Explorer will no longer be supported by Microsoft and the use of Safari web browser for Apple computers has not been tested. Um, we have had reports of some issues while using that browser. So we have a hint here on screen size. So when you cannot scroll down to make a selection, uh, so you can see here in the screen that the select button is halfway covered up and, you know, in some cases uh, it's not there at all. Uh, we've had, I've, I have had that conversation with several people and, and everybody else on the tier two staff has had that conversation that the button is just not there. If you do control minus, that'll allow you to minimize the screen and then you can see the button and click it. And if it does make it so small that it's unusable, you can do control that control minus uh, to make it small, but you can do control plus to make it bigger again. So I would hate to 
to hear that you have to do that, but those are tools at your at your use if you must do that. So when you log into your Steers account and confirm your logins, you will select Tier 2 Reporting. Now, if you have access to several customer numbers, you're going to see a listing of all of those customer numbers reflected in your Tier 2 account list. Now, this will include all that you uh, successfully added to your account and and gotten the, all the secondary approvals. If you do not see your CN number, then there is a secondary approval after the Steers SPA is signed and accepted that, that is pending. So it may be if you're the primary account holder, um, you need to let us know. Hey, authorize my request. Um, you know, shouldn't be. Uh, very long for us to to find it and authorize it, but if you're trying to do something, you know, middle of reporting season and you requested it and you know it's been five minutes and you haven't seen it authorized, go ahead and call us. Or uh, yeah, if in that case you probably want to just call us and say, hey, can you authorize that? Um, and we can click the button and get you on your way. If you only have a single CN approved on your account, you will. Instead, go to the default landing page of your reports list. So this is an example of multiple CNs listed. Now you can so you can only be in one CN at a time. So let's say you're the person that has both of these and you have to choose. OK, I'll work on City of Happy, get done with that one. And then you can come back to your list of accounts and go into TCEQ test entity. Now, if you only have one uh, tier two report account, when you open the tier two reporting application, you'll go directly to the reports list page. And that's what uh, this page here is. It shows all of the tier two reports that are in the tier two reporting system. Remember, after you submit your report, a PDF and a data file, the XML report will be automatically generated and added on this page. So that menu, uh, you had a, a glimpse of it there on the previous slides. Well, let's go through what each of the menu options is used for. The top one is the select tier two rule. That's the one that's used to go between different CN and tier two accounts. The next one, the start draft report. If uh, let's say you report every year and everything's always the same. Well, when you come in to this screen and have that choice, that's what you're going to click. You're going to click start draft report. It's used to create a new report. And it is in a draft status until it is submitted. The next one is export print reports. This is used for creating customer exports or reports to print. So you can go there to, um, if you you know to to search by county, uh, a lot of different search options. If you say don't want the file that was shown on the previous screen on the far right. And next is reports list. That's the page that you landed on. Uh, you can use that to search for report. Oh, actually, yes, you can use that to search for reports, uh, year, report type. Next is the facility report search. This is used to search for facilities. There's a button below that add contact to multiple facilities, and we're going to cover that uh, a little bit when we get to contacts. It can be a real handy tool if you, let's say you've got several facilities and the contact that you want to add is going to be the same across all those facilities. Well, that's the button that you're, you're going to use. And then authorize users for account. It's used for those with primary access to authorize users requesting secondary or prepare access. OK, so back to. 
tier two reporting. There's the menu on the left, and you will see at the top above tier two account role, there's three lines that's called a hamburger stack. If you click on that, that will minimize the menu and you'll have just a hamburger stack and you could click on it to expand it out. When it's minimized, you'll still have those icons um, if you want it to work just off of icons. But I'll give you more room. Let's say you have a small screen and minimizing that menu will give you more space. So this is the export and print reports page. You'll have your facility search info. In this case, there's no records found. And at the bottom, you'll have your export options. So the one on the, the bottom left is for XML. And then you have in the middle export facilities to one PDF and on the far right export each facility to a separate PDF. All right, so what are the steps to file your tier two report? You use, use these steps if you filed your tier two report last year and have minimal changes. So you log in, you'll click on that start a draft report, choose a, re choose a type of report and title, add your facilities, review the data, make sure everything is accurate, update any information as necessary, you click on validate your report. Then click on after it passes validation, then you can use the submit report button. You want to use the validate your report button first because the processing is really fast. And we'll let you know if there's anything needs to be corrected. And when you click on the submit report, there's more processing involved. And so if there's any errors, it just takes you longer to find that out. After you've submitted the report, you will export or print the report, and then you'll send copies to the LEPC and local fire station. And as I said before, you will keep a copy for yourself accessible. So for you, that may mean printing it out, or for you, it may mean having access via computer. Okay, so this screen is showing after you have clicked on Start Draft Report. You'll then select the report type and the year is gonna be 2021 for your upcoming annual report. And that type would have been selected as annual. And I talked earlier about the report title. This is, remember, where you want to make it easier on you as far as managing reports in the system. Um, you know, even think, you know, ahead, you know, say five or 10 years from now, uh, you'll have a long list of reports and sure you can, you can sort it by year, um, but it's, uh, it's going to be useful to have a, a report title. It's going to get cluttered after a while. Um, especially if you have multiple reports throughout the year that are being submitted. And down below is add existing facility. It's uh, in the middle, close to the bottom. That's where you're gonna click to add your facilities. Uh, real important to, to note that because you don't search for the facilities on this page. You have to click add existing facility and it will bring up all of those that have been affiliated through tier two core data. And then you'll click save. So this is what you see after you click add existing facility. Facilities available to be added to this report, uh, then mark the checkbox to select them. There's a button up top where you can include inactive facilities. It defaults to no, but you can change that to yes, and then you will see facilities that were previously marked as closed. And I don't think we have a slide on it, so I'm going to go ahead and mention it right here. Um, 
after April 1st, let's say you have an, uh, a new facility, you won't see it on this list uh, after clicking add existing facilities unless you had selected a report type of initial. But you do have that overlap time frame of January 1st to April 1st to put those new facilities into a annual report. So if your facility is missing, you got to ask yourself, uh, have you properly affiliated the facility RN, Tier C, and TXT2 numbers? This only has to be done once. And if you have reported for this facility before, uh, it's not a problem. Was your facility marked as inactive on a previous report? If so, mark yes on the include inactive facilities option. This works on annual or initial reports. Is your facility present on another draft report? So a facility RN can only be present on one draft report at a time. You can use the transfer facility button to move facilities between draft reports. Okay, so on this screen, notice that the RN numbers are just basic uh, black text, like there's, they're just like the rest of the line. But after you click save, they're blue. So that means that you can click on those RN numbers and you can go in and work on the facility, chemicals, and contacts. You'll notice now also you have that transfer facility button. So let me go back a slide. On this slide, you only have add existing facility. That's because this is not yet a draft report. Now, this is after you click save. It's a draft report and you're able to transfer facilities from one draft to another. And you know that transferring that's of course within the CN. It's not from you know you cannot transfer across CNs. So I just want to clarify that it all has to occur within the CN. All right. So on this page, you'll see uh, it says up towards the top. Uh, this is a draft tier to your account report. You got your account information. And you've got the facilities that are present on the draft report. In this case, it's just the one facility. And this is where that RN search box would come in handy. If you had, let's say, 100 facilities in this draft, you'll see that that RN and the facility name are boxes where you can start to type in text to say, you know, search for a specific RN that you want to work on. So that's what those are for. For example, in this case here, there's there's three different RNs. And in the RN search box, if you typed in like the fat, uh, the last four digits of one of the RNs, let's say 5064, then that would filter it out to where you only see the line for TCEQ El Paso test. You can add additional facilities to the draft report. Um, and like I said before, don't uh, submit a report until you've got everything in it that you want in it. So sometimes I'll get a call. Somebody says, yeah, I've got I got three of my sites in here, but there's actually four. Well, let's get that figured out for you and and have you submit a complete report of all four facilities instead of you um, you know settling and saying I'll do three now and one later because uh, you want to you're going to want to do it all this one report and we can help you get that accomplished. The facilities must be reviewed individually by clicking on the hyperlink of the facility you want to work on. OK, so this is what it looks like. Uh, we talked earlier about facility and then we talked about chemicals and we talked about contacts. Well, this is what it looks like. These are the sections of the tier two report. 
And right now we are on the facility tab. So the address, uh, latitude, longitude. No, I'm sorry, the. Um, yeah, adjust the latitude, longitude and address data as appropriate. We do have a hyperlink there it says show facility on map. So you would click on that and like I said before with our our maps be a, a little bit patient, you know, give it, you know, 10 or 15 seconds to load. And you can use that to either confirm that it's accurate or to. Select your location. So down below under physical address, this information may be locked. Uh, if if you're not able to interact with those fields, that means that on our end we need to unlock it, make it so that you can, and you'll need to reach out to us and let us know to please unlock that specific RN. If you're going to fill out a customer help form, uh, please tell us which RN it is, and we will unlock it and let you know that it is available. OK, so this is uh, what you get when you click on the show location on map. It's uh, the same mapper that we saw before. If you do run into an issue of the system telling you that it does not fall within the county and you have verified that it does fall within the county, uh, let us know. And issues like that don't come up very often, but uh, when they do, just let us know that you need help. OK, so facility status information on the facility tab, you will find information on when the facility was first active for tier two reporting purposes. You can mark the date you sold the facility or were no longer re required to report for it. Please, please keep in mind that 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 closed, sold or stopped storing tier two chemicals that that that's not to be. Uh, don't don't mistake that for anything else because it will make the facility inactive. So closing out a facility, you'll then have to if you've selected a closure date or and no longer required to to have the chemical or report it. Uh, you must provide the reason that you're in activating the facility and uh, they can be reactivated with an initial report later on if if relevant okay so now we're going to go to the chemicals tab so on this screen you'll see that a chemical has already been entered it's propane and let's say that you have, uh, let's say you wanted to add sulfuric acid. You could click add and that'll take you to a screen where you could search for sulfuric acid. Below that is where you can add attachments such as site plans. Uh, but I will say, please do not add your safety data sheets. We want the attachments to be things like uh, site plans. Um, but not not safety data sheets. So let's say you were going to add another chemical. There's a a blue uh, hyperlink there. Select chemical. That's what you're going to need to click on to search for the chemical. And this is the screen that you'll get after you do that. So this is another one of those searches where if you were to put in the cast number and the name, you, you decrease your chances of getting a result. So search by either the cast number or the chemical name. And then click search. And if you the search results uh, don't include what you're. The chemical you're looking for, let's say you have a proprietary chemical that is not just, you know, a common chemical that would be in our database, then click back. And that will allow you to enter in information. 
But let's say your search was for chlorine. So you typed in the name chlorine. This is uh, what we're going to do later during the Q&A and live is, is entering chlorine. So you, you do a search for chlorine, you get a lot of results, and you're not sure which one it is. Well, that's where that safety data sheet is really handy because you look at the cast number that's on your safety data sheet and you see that it's 7782-50-5. And notice that it's the one marked as yes for EHS. So this is showing the same that we use just the chemical name search, whereas we could have done a cast number search instead. Yeah, the chemical name search gave us four different cast numbers. Some are EHS, some are not. And there's actually a total of 62 records by searching for chlorine. But if you had that safety data sheet with you, it would have been better to search by cast number rather than chemical name. So that search result gives you multiple different names. They're all EHS and it gives you nine records to, to look through rather than 62. Okay, so then you have selected the chemical and you'll see, let's see. Well, now you're on the screen where you can put in the amount in largest container. And, and you'll start to work on the physical state and the hazards. So this is one bit of information that we have not yet made required, but it's extremely useful. Uh, the actual max amount largest container. You'll notice that the required fields for amount is ranges, the maximum daily amount range, and also the average daily amount range. But we have been told by first responders that actual max amount largest container is useful information to them. So please provide that if you have it. All right, so back to physical state and hazards and health effects. So when you're going through this the first time, you know, you you might miss some of these uh, fields. And if you do, it'll get picked up on the validation. So no big deal. It'll we'll get the information eventually, but just go through and make sure you address all the required fields, uh, physical state, pick pure or mixture, and also pick solid, liquid, and or gas. And then you'll need to interact with the health effects and as well as the hazards to select the appropriate ones based on the safety data sheet. Safety data sheet. So down closer to the bottom, you'll see constituent chemicals uh, if dealing with a mixture and what we mean by mixture is that it easily separates. Uh, for example, uh, gasoline has numerous, uh, you know, a whole lot of components to it, but we consider it pure because it's not easily separated. So you can report gasoline as pure. You don't need to give us, you know, the benzene and all the other constituents and percentages of gasoline. That's that's not what we need, and, and that's not how we define mixture. It, for us in the Tier 2 reporting program, a mixture is one that easily separates. Then down below that, you'll see locations. Uh, this is the storage location of the chemical, a detailed storage location. And this is also where we were having a conversation about if you've got multiple locations of that chemical at the facility, you would list each of those locations here. You know, you may have, let's say, um, in warehouse A in the southwest corner, you may be storing this chemical, and that would be one storage location. And then you would add another one if you have the chemical, say, at warehouse B in the southeast corner.
So now let's talk about the health effects and physical hazards. You've got an add button for each, and you've also below that, uh, close to the middle, a uh, checkbox for hazard not otherwise classified, which if appropriate would be indicated on the safety data sheet. So when you expand the health effects and hazards, this is what they look like. You choose what's appropriate based on the safety data sheet. And then select OK. That location uh, field that I was going on about. You click add. And that's what the screen looks like after you click add. You'll put the location within facility, which needs to be descriptive. Um, chemical location description should allow someone unfamiliar with the facility to find the hazardous material. Then you'll need to put the container type. The drop down has several choices, uh, container temperature and pressure, and then you can select yes or no for the storage location is confidential. So now to the contacts page. Let's say that uh, this is you know brand new. There's there's uh, no contacts. Uh, go ahead and go to add. And if it's brand new, you could just start entering the contact information. If it's not, uh, let's say that you've got a. This is let's say this is the third facility in the report that you're working on and for some reason you did not use the add contact to multiple facilities. So what you do, go ahead and click on select existing contact and you could search. Well, actually, it'll bring up a list. Let's see. Yeah, it'll bring up a list of contacts for you to choose from. So you can choose one of those and click select. Now, as far as the required contact information, there are certain rules that are required in the report. Those are owner operator, tier two information contact, billing contact, emergency contact, and if you have an EHS that you're reporting a facility emergency coordinator. And keep in mind for the emergency contact, you have to have a 24 hour phone type, and then you have to have a second number that is different than the one provided as a 24 hour phone type. And when you're adding uh, phone numbers, um, please keep in mind that the way that the, the system was programmed, if you need to replace a phone number, you have to first add the new one and then you can delete the old one. Um, it's just uh, the way it's programmed that let's say there's there's let's say this is a tier two information contact and there's only one phone number listed there. You can't just delete it because that would leave it with no phone number. Uh, the way it's programmed, you need to first add a new one and then you can delete the old one. And then make sure you save it. And if that's the only thing that you're doing in a report, let's say this is, you know, in June, uh, you can do that with an update report. So I, I mentioned several times today about phone type, and now I can finally show you what I'm talking about. So I keep talking about one of the emergency contact phone numbers has to have a 24 hour phone type. Well, this is the screen that shows that. It shows type and then you would select 24 hour. And then put in the phone number. That is not 911, but to someone that is local and can be available for questions and or decisions during an incident. OK, so when you're making changes to existing contact, uh, when you try to save these changes that you have made to an existing contact record, you will be asked whether you would like to apply the changes to all instances of that contact. 
Applying changes will update the contact on every facility the contact record is included with. And I've uh, mentioned a couple of times this uh, add contact to multiple facilities. What you would do is you would click on the button there uh, in the menu, um, add contact to multiple facilities. And then when you get to the screen here, you have to select which facilities that you want that to apply to. The facilities must uh, be present on the draft report to appear in the add contact to multiple facilities function. OK, so you've gone through the whole report. Uh, you've you know, either entered your data or verified that everything is accurate, and then you want to select to validate report data. But something happened. And if errors exist, you will get a notification and a report submittal error log. You see up top it says this account has errors, uh, a teacher report, account report has errors, and then down towards the bottom of this page, you'll see the error log. It's a PDF that tells you what went wrong. Um, we don't have a, a, a screenshot of that, but um, you know it'll list out. You know you need to provide at least one chemical. Um, you know th different issues that could come up. So after it's passed validation and you don't have any ugly messages and you're ready to proceed, you click Start Submission, and then you get to this page. And there's one of those certification boxes that can be easy to miss. You'll put in your title, your signature, and your STEERS password. So if your report submission has multiple facilities, you may get this notification at the top of your screen that states you will get an email when the report has processed within 24 hours or call the tier two program if you do not receive the email. And after the processing is complete, you will get a confirmation of submittal. This is what the confirmation of submittal looks like. At least the top portion, the bottom portion, um, has uh, facility information and fees. So the confirmation of submittal serves as proof that the tier two report has been submitted for the listed facilities. It includes a summary of the fees if it is an annual or initial report. And of course, there is a convenient pay now button if you want to pay right then and there. You can also completely leave steers and come back, you know, at a later date as long as, you know, don't well, don't go. Into the delinquent uh, number of days out, but you know, you can come back um, the next day or so after you've gotten approval to pay and click on the pay now button. It'll still be there for you. If you don't want to. Pay online, you can just wait for us to send you an invoice. We we send them out a couple of times a month, I think it is now. And so when you when you want to do that, just don't do any don't interact with the pay now and uh, just wait for an invoice to come in the mail to the billing contact. We do have some updated information on paying online through the ePay. The credit card payments do have a service fee of around 2.25 percent. Uh, and we say uh, around that because it depends upon the amount. You can use ACH. Uh, used to be a really low limit on making the ACH payments, but now you can pay up to $80,000 rather than having a $1,000 limit. So, you're not completely done. Uh, let's say that you had 
uh, got through the confirmation of submittal and you went through the pay now. Well, don't leave just yet. You have to still get your reports, uh, your report to send to your LAPC and fire department. So the reports list page has uh, the files column where you can click on the icon and it'll download your file. Or you can go to the report detail page and you can also generate custom export jobs by searching for specific facilities or locations. So this is that reports list page. It's got the, the files uh, there on the bottom right side of the screen. So smaller reports will submit and automatically create report files. So larger ones will need to process and that's the ones where you'll get an email within 24 hours. So if you've got one facility and just a few chemicals, it's going to process right away and your file is available. Uh, please do let us know if you're submitting uh, some of these larger reports and you have not. You have not seen that it's completed within 24 hours. Uh, you'll get an email and you know that's it's easy to miss the email for a lot of people uh, but after 24 hours if you log in to tier two reporting and you see that it is it's not completed and you don't have a file to download let us know so we can start to investigate it all right but creating custom reports so when you go to export print reports you have a lot of different options, uh, different ways that you can create a custom export. You can search by location, which is one of the more common ways to do it. Uh, for example, you could search by county or zip code. Uh, let's say you've got a report that has. Um, let's say it's 100 facilities and there's 20 facilities across five different counties. Well, you would want to come here and do search by location and do five custom exports, one for each county. Because that's going to provide useful information to the particular LEPCs. And furthermore, you may want to narrow it down by zip code if you're wanting to give uh, the fire departments only the ones that are relevant to them. But um, you could check with the fire department and see if they want the county file uh, see if that's OK for them or what they prefer. So. The thing about doing the exports is it'll process it. And could you know, a lot of cases it's going to be done before you can even go over to click on export print reports again to refresh the page. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say is it's going to it's not going to just show up on the page that you're on. You have to refresh it and the way that I like to do that is I like to go over to. Export print reports and click on that once again and uh, that refreshes the page and you'll see your file is waiting for you. And it's only going to wait for you uh, for five days and then it will go away. OK. So here's a scenario my company has never reported before. What do I do? You get your steers account if you don't already have one. You add tier two core data and sign the steers participation agreement. You affiliate your numbers, sign and submit. Then you add tier two reporting and sign the SPA again. Uh, assuming that 15 minutes has passed since the uh, previous signing the SPA. And then you can go into tier two reporting, add your facility, chemical and contact data. You'll validate and submit the report. You'll print the report or export. Uh, to you know, send electronically by PDF and or XML file, and then you'll send those to your LEPC and local fire department. 
All right, uh, what about this scenario? I reported last year and same facilities, you know, uh, nothing's changed. So you get a steers count if needed. Uh, you know, you may be the new person that's hired and the reporting was done last year and that person's either gone or doesn't want to do it anymore. And so you need to get your steers account, then open tier two reporting, you know, click on add a draft report and add the click on the add, add facilities button and add the relevant facilities, save it, and then go into each RN, review and update the facility chemical and contact data for each, validate and submit the report. Then you'll do your export and send it off. Okay, what about this scenario? I reported last year and I added a new facility. All right, uh, get a steers count if you need to. And for that new facility, you need to use tier two core data to affiliate that RN number to the CN number. Um, if there was an RN number, if, if not, then you'll be getting a brand new RN number and affiliating to your CN number. Uh, sign and submit. For a new facility, add new CN to your account if um, if it's uh, a new company altogether. Sign the steers participation agreement, uh, add a draft report, review, validate, submit, uh, save, copy of the report, and do your exports to send to LEPC and fire department. All right, and now let's say you sold the facility. So what are the expectations for for that situation? So you'll need to file your report. Um, you click on add existing facilities, select the facility that was sold, and on the facility tab, you will you'll need to input the date that it was closed, sold, or stopped storing tier two chemicals. And that'll be the end of your obligation for that facility. So let's say you sold it. Um, let's say you sold it in November uh, 2021. Then you're still going to be filing an annual report and you're going to be closing out that facility in the annual report. And this is this uh, calendar button there with the blank space. That's where you're going to do that. Let's see, so that is going to take us through that final presentation.